Some days you have to. All right, so talking in terms and hopefully finishing up, spiritual alignment. Spiritual alignment. Because here's the thing. We've lost it. And we can't blame the world because the church isn't leading in this. I don't mean at Oasis. I mean the church, by and large, is not leading like we should. And I've been corrected by God on this myself recently. Um, Apostle Paul wrote, obey the civil authorities. Obey the authorities that are over you, right? And many of us are not happy with this president or that president. And we've been very vocal about it. You know? And, and surely you see things wrong and, and you point them out. But the truth is, he wouldn't be there if God didn't have him. You know? No president would be there because, and it's very explicit in the word. It's very clear. This is not something I'm making up. It's very clear. And I want to take you back to when Jesus was with Pilate and he was about to go to the cross. And Pilate was prodding him, talking to him. Are you the king of the Jews? Different things, you know. And Jesus really was mute. He really wasn't saying anything in his own defense because guess what? He had to go to the cross. He wasn't trying to get out of it. But Pilate was expecting him to plead for his life. Now stop for a minute. That's the pattern of a Christian. You understand that's the pattern? You don't plead for your life. You look up. Stephen did the same thing when he was about to be stoned, right? And what did Jesus say? Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to either, to either impose the sentence or set you free? And what did Jesus say? Do you remember? It's exactly what Jesus told him. He said, you'd have no power at all if it weren't given to you by my Father. You have no authority is the actual word there. You would have no authority at all. So what can you extrapolate from that? First of all, the fact that Pilate was there and the fact that he had authority was given by God. Not even Jesus would go against it or fight against it. Jesus, Son of God, King of the world, wouldn't go against Pilate's earthly authority. Now, what if Christians live like that? We don't, but what if we did? That's certainly the pattern that Jesus set. That's his example, right? That's not to say, don't vote, don't be informed. But it also says, keep your mouth off the one that God installed. Now, we talked about family authority, we talked about church authority, so let's talk a minute about civil authority, which would be like president, congress, Supreme Court, and then local authorities. You, you understand where, where I'm going, right? Because a lot of times there's very little respect in the church for those people, but that's not God. And any place, by the way, that we depart from where God is, we, we wonder why bad things happen, but that's exactly why, because we depart from what he has set, right? You agree with that? Am I... You don't think that I'm telling the truth? You don't think Christians have distaste for politics right now and vocalize it all the time? Now I'm going to ask you an honest question. In your heart of hearts, how many of you believe that those same people, us, all of us, spend just as much time praying for those leaders as we do running them down with our mouths? Now we're big, we're big full gospel people, right? We're the first ones to quote, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those loving it shall eat the fruit thereof. And full gospel people, and just Christians in general, are the ones, well, they don't do that, da, 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 right? Curses, curses, curses. And we wonder what we're reaping. Well, we're reaping exactly what we sow. Because we're not, we're not sowing joy and peace. We're not sowing favor. We're not sowing faith in God, right? Because how do we win? How do the Christians win? The weapons of our warfare are mighty before God. They're not physical. What are they? They're mighty before God for the tearing down of strongholds, right? Our armor is all spiritual. It's in Ephesians 6, right? The armor of God. 
and we pray and we declare and we ask God and we speak his word and his word goes and does things. We are not the people that curse things or, 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 or do that. That's not what we're supposed to be. And we don't win by physically getting in arguments with the world. You ever seen, you ever seen a, um, um, I'm trying to think of the word, dandelion. You ever seen a dandelion? Tell you what, man. You get some roundup, you hit the top of that dandelion, it'll turn brown and start going out like this. Give it about a week, that sucker will be standing right back up. If you don't get it all the way down and then get the root, that joker will be back. When we fight with the world about politics, about gender, about anything, you're just fighting the flower. You're just fighting the head of the dandelion. You think you knock that thing off, it's going to be back tomorrow morning. Because the root is spiritual. It's rooted in evil, in Satan. You cannot win by going along and cutting the top off. It's just going to grow back. And that's what most Christians do. You even see big time pastors. They're out in the marketplace talking about Christians need to mobilize. We need to do this. Let me tell you what Christians need to do. We need to mobilize. We need to pray and speak the word of God and defeat the root. Amen? And you know, you can bless the president whether you like him or not and speak life over your country and speak the word of God over your people, over your nation, over your county, and things will change from the inside out. Because you're dealing with the root. And a new plant will grow up. And it takes time. And over time, you'll just see everything changes where people pray. But where Christians are more politically active than they are on their knees. You just see a bunch of frustrated Christians. Usually what you see. A bunch of fussing. They act just like the world. You know? And I mean, we all do it. But let's stay focused. I really think Satan wants to bait us into the natural realm because he knows us where he can knock us out. I, I do. I really think that they bait us over into the natural realm because you spend all your energy and time there, then you're not praying. And he knows that, that, that really, that's an arrow to his heart. That'll get him, you know. So, in the family, what's the structure? We're doing three authorities. What are our three authorities now that we've established, that God has established? And these are, these, are, these are the simple, basic authorities, okay? Three of them. So what are they? Let's start. What's the highest one that started in Genesis? Family, right? And who on earth is the delegated authority of God in the family? The husband, right. And then who? The wife. And then who? I don't know if the kids do or not. I don't think they really have any authority. I think they're supposed to just submit. I'll be honest with you. I don't see in Scripture where it says that it's husband, wife, then the kids have some kind of authority in the house. I don't see that. I think that when they grow up and have their own house, then they come into a level of authority. But I think as long as their parents, and really, I'm going to be honest with you, as long as their parents are alive. Because the Bible says, honor your father and mother. It doesn't say honor your father and mother as long as you're in their house. It doesn't say honor your father and mother as long as they're paying for everything. It just says, honor your father and your mother. And the Hebrew pattern was, a man would go out and get his wife, come live with his father and mother, and take care of them as they aged. So you can see how that would apply, right? Amen? What's the next one? If we, if we, what's the, all right, so the next one, say we had family, what do we have now? Church. So, all right, what's, what, what's God's delegated authority in the church? What are, there are five of them. Apostle, pastor, teacher, prophet, evangelist. Good job, yeah. So, and, and I always think of them in order of Ephesians. That's the only way I memorize So, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, right? And so, that's God's delegated authority in the church. So, what about now in the nation? Civil authority, Right. So here, primarily, that'd be the president. And then also, you have Congress, and then also Supreme Court. Isn't that interesting? I mean, think about the original offices in the Old Testament. 
And we talked a little bit at Wednesday, but let's let's brush this up so everybody knows. Well, now there, now now Jesus is represented by delegated authority, a fivefold office: apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But before Jesus, you only had three people really that represented God that were anointed to represent God. You remember? PPK. Who was it? Prophet, priest, and king. Good job. Old Testament. Three anointings represent God. Prophet, priest, king. Y'all realize those are, those are the three levels of authority in a way. The prophet represents kind of church. Priest represents the father kind of thing. He represents you to the father. And the king is the civil authority in a way. All right? So were kings important? When that was the plan, were kings important? I mean, you think about King David. Think about King Solomon. You understand they represented God. You understand God is represented through the president too and Congress. And just the same as you wouldn't have gone against King David, we shouldn't go against the one he sets now. They're there on our behalf to keep order. And we not, may not like the nuances, but they're still not generally letting people rob and pillage in the streets. And that's to our benefit. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right, so um, I want to, Exodus twenty two twenty eight says this, and I want to read it. I want to read it verbatim so that you'll, you'll hear it. But um, this is what it says. And, and I think that we need a dose of this. I know I need a dose of it, and I believe the Lord was saying that everybody needs a dose of it. So um, here it is. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. Exodus twenty two twenty eight. It's also quoted in Acts. Paul quoted it in Acts when he was speaking to the high priest. The high priest was getting on to him. And Apostle Paul didn't know it was the high priest. And the high priest had one of his servants slap Paul, or one of the servants did slap Paul. And Apostle Paul looked at the high priest, said, you whitewashed wall, and started talking to him. And one of the people next to him reminded him, said, he's, he's the high priest. And Apostle Paul said, oh, I didn't realize it. He said, for it says, you will not, you will not revile your leader or curse a leader of your people. He said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. So, you understand a lot, stay with me on this. You understand a lot of times we get saved, we're gospel people, and we think we're just free from every restraint. You ever notice Christians do that? They get saved and they say, oh, we're free now. We can do whatever we want, right? And there's Paul. He was the freest of any of us because Jesus took him to the third heaven and explained the gospel. And as soon as Paul found out that was the high priest, he, he said, I'm sorry. I did not realize your position. Do you understand the leaders who founded the church still kept authorities and honored them? You do or you don't. Now see, we're far away from that today. And I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit has put on my heart. That's why so many bad things happen in the church. Because God has set up, if you will, walls of protection. And we just rush through them like they don't matter anymore. He set things that will keep us and protect us from hurting ourselves. I want you to know, I had somebody, I'm making this up because I don't want to use their situation and their thing. So, but it was something like this, all right? Somebody came to me and said, this young lady was killed in a car wreck, blah, blah, blah. She's a Christian. She's a great girl. She's very active in the youth group. How in the world could God let this happen, Right? And so I asked a few questions. Well, all right, was she driving? Yeah, yeah, she was driving. Well, was she speeding? No, no, not speeding. Well, was she drinking or anything? Had she been out too late or anything? Nope, nope, no. Nope. Well, what happened? Well, they think she was texting. I'm like, well, that's simple then. What do you mean? It's simple. Well, how's it simple? She wasn't obeying the civil authority. She got killed. You can't text and drive. That's simple. But, but, but God should have, no, 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 God did. You, you missing it, brother. So you done got all Christian, but you forgot the Bible. God said, obey the civil authority. If you don't, you take your life in your own hands. That's what he said. 
The civil authority said, do not text while you drive. The civil authority said, stop at the stop sign. Civil authority said, run under 70 miles an hour. You want Satan to swat you? Just break the civil authority. You want to have to go to prison? Just break the civil authority. The Bible's clear. You'll pay every moment of the sentence put on you. God was with you the whole time as you broke his law. People don't understand this. God delegated governorship of people to men. They are called the civil authority. We are not little gods running around and get to set up our own rules. When he set Donald Trump in office and he set Congress and he set the Supreme Court, the law of our nation is set and God's authority is on it. He won't go against it. Now, if you, were here, if you were here Wednesday night, let's talk about this for a minute. If you were here Wednesday night, and we talked about family, we talked about that sometimes uh, Christian women have husbands that, that go off the reservation and do crazy stuff. Do you remember? But, and, 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 and that's just the example I'm using. But in any example, what's the answer for the person who's not the delegated authority and is, is charged with following? Say it again. To follow. Unless they're telling you to do something that specifically breaks God's law, like go murder somebody, if it's something in the confines and structure of their, of their authority, you just do it. And people don't get this. But by and large, we don't get it because we haven't read the Bible and looked at it. We haven't looked for patterns and examples, right? And we use the example of Sarah, Abraham's wife. What was the example? Anybody remember? Yes, ma'am. Right. Abraham, being the head of the house, was accountable to God. Sarah was accountable both to him and God. Right? He's the head. She has two heads. Abraham, who represents God, and then God himself. So Abraham looked at his wife and said, hey, we're going into a rough area. I want you to tell this king that you're my sister, because otherwise they'll kill me and take you. Now that is nuts, any way you slice it. And, and quite honestly, it proved Abraham didn't have a lot of faith. I mean, I'm going to see him one day. He'll probably judge me on me saying that. But I think that's fair because we've all done crazy things. So we're using his life as an example. Matter of fact, Hebrews says that that's given to us as an example. So I don't think he's going to get mad, right? But think about it for a minute. If ever there was a chance when a wife should say, you're crazy. I'm not doing that. I am not doing that. You're asking me to lie. You're asking me to tell him. This. Not to mention, he's going to take me to his house. There's no telling what might happen. You following me? This is the gravity of this situation. She did not do that. She did what he asked her to do. And we talked. We talked about this, but I want to make sure, because the Lord's having me put this on my heart so we can move forward, but we have to set this, this ground up. We talk that even in the house, like with, you know, with the church, that the husband has an authority given him. He's God's delegated authority. And we read in Ephesians where it says, wives, or yeah, it was in Ephesians, wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And how strong that is. I mean, my gosh, think about that for a minute. Submit to your husband just like you're submitting to the Lord. Your husband represents God to you. Is another English way to say that. Submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Okay, then you take the other verses, the husband's head of the wife, two different times in the Bible, right? So what is that saying? So then, do you think Sarah believed it? Her husband asked her to lie and perhaps be taken into this guy's bedchamber. She did it. But the good news is, even though Abraham, and I have only one thing to say, he was being stupid, right? So Abraham had authority. She followed it, right? But it also did what? It created an accountability. Who has, somebody's alarm's going off. Yeah. All right. It created an accountability, Right? Are you with me? It created an accountability to who? From Abraham to God. But then we learned, and this is what's lost on American society as a whole, we learned that there's a third accountability created. When God delegates authority, that person has authority. They also have a responsibility to God. He'll hold them accountable. He might judge them and he might, they might even die 
if they mess up. Now, that don't mean go to hell. That means be just and leave the earth because you're not doing what you're called to do. There's no need to leave you here, right? But then there's this third accountability created, and we have to learn this about God. God is also accountable for the actions of those he delegates authority to. Sarah understood this. So Abraham tells her this, and she does it, right? You know the story. Those of you who were here, those of you who weren't, I'm trying to catch you up. So here's the deal. God, in two instances, he did this twice. He didn't just do this once. He tried to pull this twice. Both times, Sarah submitted to her husband. Instead of going off the reservation and rebelling, she submitted. And both times, because of the third accountability principle, God came and rescued her from that situation, didn't let anything happen. And both times when they left, they left blessed with money or gold and silver and donkeys and calves and all that kind of stuff, which is money, basically. So understand this. If the civil authority is set by God and I rebel, I just stepped out of my authority. I have no authority to rebel against the civil authority. That's God's delegated authority. So if they make a law that says you have to pay this much tax, and a lot of Christian business people would leave here crying, it says you have to pay this much tax. And guess what? It's the law. You submit to it. You know what I'm saying? The best you can, the best you know how, you have to do it. And, and we'd say, but that's just wrong. It's wrong. This is wrong. It ought to not be this way. Yeah, it, it, all right, all of that's true. Just like Sarah could have said about Abraham. But the fact of the matter is, they've got the authority. You are to submit. Now, if it truly is wrong, it'll trigger the accountability principle by God, and he'll come in on your behalf and make it up to you. Good. 